I tracked. Let's head back to the junkie article. It continues. Who are these men's rights activists? Given that most positions of power and influence in contemporary society are occupied by men, nearly every position in the current Australian government's cabinet, for example, it seems weird that there even is such a thing as a men's rights movement. What rights are men currently denied? Well, I only need to name one to destroy your argument. And the most obvious one is the right to bodily integrity. As the author mentioned Australia, and is in fact from my hometown of Melbourne, let's use an Australian example. Although this example is still relevant throughout the Western world. So what is the legal stance on female genital mutilation in Australia? Coverage of existing offenses. At present, female genital mutilation is criminalized exclusively by state and territory laws. All states and territories have passed criminal legislation prohibiting female genital mutilation. Further, in each state and territory, these laws apply extraterritorially to protect Australian residents from being subjected to female genital mutilation overseas. Accordingly, existing legislation provides extensive criminalization of female genital mutilation both within and outside Australia. While existing state and territory laws comprehensively criminalize female genital mutilation, three areas of inconsistency have been identified that could present opportunities to strengthen Australia's legal framework. These relate to consistency of penalty, consistency of age coverage, and consistent extraterritorial application of offenses. This report recommends that states and territories consider amending their laws to address these issues. In addition, during the review of existing laws, queries were raised about how existing female genital mutilation laws would apply to female genital cosmetic procedures. Such procedures are alleged to be occurring more frequently since the last time model laws were discussed by the jurisdictions. This is a complex issue, which this report has been unable to fully consider. However, this report recommends that further work on this issue be progressed. So the practice of female genital mutilation is outlawed in every single state in Australia, and with good reason, because it's a harmful practice that should be outlawed. And here in Australia, females have the human right to bodily integrity. If they are under the age of 18, no one has the right to cut or surgically alter their genitals without an exceptionally good medical reason. And those cases are rare. But what about male genital mutilation? What about males under the age of consent having the basic human right to bodily integrity? Well, here in Australia, that right doesn't exist, if you are male. Next. The historical genesis of the movement makes it clear that men's rights activists are not so much arguing for a coherent position but, instead, are arguing against another position, namely, feminism. Hold on, but cannot the same argument be used against feminism? If we are going to play this game, then couldn't it be argued that feminists are just arguing against patriarchy, or traditionalism, or gender roles? Just because one movement, or position, disagrees with or argues against another, doesn't mean that movement or position is not valid. And many things that feminists claim to be against, MRAs are also against. We often hear that feminists are against the draft, guess what so are we? We also often hear that feminists are against male circumcision, guess what, so are we. Although feminists don't seem to be doing a lot to fix these issues, our problem is with the ideology at the core of mainstream feminism. And that ideology runs counter to us achieving our goals. That ideology blames all the world's problems on males and masculinity, while at the same time ignoring or excusing away our issues. So of course we stand in opposition to it, what choice do we have if we want to achieve our goals? Next. One of the first men's rights movements, the Bund für Monarcht or League for Men's Rights, was founded in Austria in March 1926 with the explicit aim of counteracting the excesses of post-World War I women's emancipation movements. And I would have to ask, how exactly is that relevant to the modern-day men's rights movement? Next. The strength and popularity of men's rights movements since then seems to have closely tracked the growing influence of feminist movements, such as the great flowering of second-wave feminist thought in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Now, 
thanks to the Internet and its own corresponding explosion of feminist voices, men's rights activists from across the globe can come together online to share their grievances about the modern world. Share their grievances about the modern world? You mean like feminists do? And social justice warriors? And gamer gators? And migtos? And atheists? And Christians? And right-wingers? And left-wingers? And sports fans? And competitive origami enthusiasts? And just about any other group you could name? What's your point? Is it somehow different when MRAs do it? Next. The key assertion of men's rights activists is that men do not have power or privilege over women. Rather, they posit, men are victimized by a social structure that favors women. Men's rights activists point to a number of facts that, they claim, support the central tenet, the fact that men are more likely to die while working than women. The fact that men are more likely to be the victims of violent crime than women and the fact that women are more frequently awarded full custody of children in divorce proceedings than men. They also point to some facts that are not facts at all, such as the risible claim that 50% or more of rapes reported to police did not happen, when in fact sexual assault is vastly underreported. These, they argue, prove that contemporary Western societies are structured to favor women at the expense of men. Okay, let's deal with this 50% figure. So it's time once again to click the link and go further down the rabbit hole. This time we find ourselves at the SPLC website with a report called Men's Rights Movement Spreads False Claims About Women. Oh boy. Anyway, the relevant segment reads. The claim, close to half or even more of the sexual assaults reported by women never occurred. Versions of this claim are a mainstay of sites like RegisterHer.com which specializes in vilifying women who allegedly lie about being raped. Such claims are also sometimes made by men involved in court custody battles. My understanding is that Register Her was originally a spin-off site from AVFM, but now seems to be run by John the Other and Diana Davidson. And I think it's safe to say that it's changed considerably since this article was written by the SPLC so I'm unable to check if the 50% claim was ever made, or if SPLC has reported it in its proper context. Although I find the sentence, such claims are also sometimes made by men involved in court custody battles, very strange. Why would a father trying to get custody of his children bring up rape statistics? Unless the SPLC is referring to the, women who allegedly lie about being raped, line. But once again, why would a father trying to get custody of his children in court bring up that some women lie about being raped, unless of course, he's been accused of rape by his ex during the custody battle? I'm guessing the SPLC are incapable of seeing any ulterior motive on the part of the accuser. But let's continue with what SPLC has to say. The reality, this claim, which has gained some credence in recent years, is largely based on a 1994 article in the Archives of Sexual Behavior by Eugene Kennan that found that 41% of rape allegations in his study were false. But Kennan's methodology has been widely criticized, and his results do not accord with most other findings. Kennan researched only one unnamed Midwestern town, and he did not spell out the criteria police used to decide an allegation was false. The town also polygraphed or threatened to polygraph all alleged victims, a now discredited practice that is known to cause many women to drop their complaint even when it is true. In fact, most studies that suggest high rates of false accusations make a key mistake, equating reports described by police as unfounded with those that are false. Now this is very interesting, because feminists do exactly the same thing. They assume that any and all allegations are true even when they are unfounded, and often when they have been proven false. The simple truth is, we don't know the actual number of true or false claims. The vast majority of rape claims are simply unknown. Next. The truth is that unfounded reports very often include those for which no corroborating evidence could be found or where the victim was deemed an unreliable witness, often because of drug or alcohol use or because of prior sexual contact with the attacker. They also include those cases where women recant their accusations, 
often because of a fear of reprisal, a distrust of the legal system or embarrassment because drugs or alcohol were involved. The best studies, where the rape allegations have been studied in detail, suggest a rate of false reports of somewhere between 2% and 10%. The most comprehensive study, conducted by the British Home Office in 2005, found a rate of 2.5% for false accusations of rape. The best U.S. investigation, the 2008, Making a Difference, study, found a 6.8% rate. Let's assume for a moment that 6.8% of rape allegations are proven to be false. That does not mean that 93.2% of rape allegations are thus true. The simple truth is, in most cases we simply don't know. But back to the junkie article, as we are just about to be schooled on the pickup artists, oh joy. Next. Men's rights activists and pickup artistry. A recent development in men's rights activism is its connection with another social movement, that of pickup artistry. The central idea of pickup artistry is that women can be seduced by applying certain techniques, including, nagging, a compliment with a backhanded sting in its tail, designed to make a woman feel insecure, peacocking, wearing one outlandish accessory that will draw women's attention, and, kino, touching a woman casually during conversation to establish a precedent of physical contact. Of course, pickup artistry is creepy as fuck because it's so overtly rapey. What it says to men is that if women aren't interested in you, you can use this one weird old trick to make them have sex with you. It basically treats dating as a video game rather than an interaction between two equal adults, with sex as the reward for mastering complex maneuvers of button pushing, just like the fatalities in Mortal Kombat. Okay, so he told us what pickup artists are, but he failed to demonstrate one very important thing. Did you pick it? He claimed a connection between MRAs and PUAs, but at no time does he explain it or demonstrate it. In fact all the things he talked about have zero to do with the men's rights movement. But he has some more to say, so maybe he's just building up to the reveal of this connection. Next. Pick up artistry, which reached the mainstream thanks to the popularity of Neil Strauss's 2005 bestseller The Game, also comes packaged with its own evolutionary theory. This theory argues that certain men are alphas, who can effortlessly dominate other men and have their pick of women, while nice guy, betas, will supply women with their emotional and material needs without ever getting any nookie. Men who cannot demonstrate their physical or social attractiveness will become incel, or involuntarily celibate. There's that fucking word again. Next. When you combine this pseudoscience with men's rights activism, a toxic worldview emerges, women are seen as parasites who feed off men and don't even have the decency to sleep with them to return the favor. Wow. Once again note that he doesn't actually show a connection, he just insinuates. But it's time we climbed back out of this rabbit hole, and headed back to cake, as we had been off on a tangent, and still have the exposing MRAs article to rip through. 